As sports history fans, we often reminisce about the legends. Willis Reed limping on to the NBA Finals Court, Kurt Schilling's bloody sock, Kerry Strug's courageous dismount, and so many more. These moments often define sports history. But what about the countless injuries that did not become legends or careers that were derailed due to inadequate care? That's where this episode sponsor comes in. Introducing to you, ILP Sports Consultants, your trusted sports injury partner available 24-7. Brian Maelli at ILP Sports Consultants has over 20 years of experience in the orthopedic and sports medicine industry, and he has worked with athletes across the gamut, from youth to amateurs, professionals, in almost every sport played in the United States of America, accommodating athletes at every stage of their career. This adaptability ensures that ILP services are perfectly tailored to your skill level, no matter where you are in your athletic journey. With ILP, you are in control. Choose the steps that matter most to you. Diagnosis, treatment plan, recovery, or the whole journey. ILP services are tailored to your unique needs. Rushing for care is a common pitfall leading to future problems. ILP Sports Consultants helps you make the right decisions, ensuring that you receive timely and safe care. And here's a bonus. Brian hosts the Injured List podcast, sharing insights and athlete stories you won't want to miss. Whether you're a concerned parent or grandparent or an athlete yourself seeking guidance, ILP Sports Consultants is your beacon of hope in sports injury management. Visit ILPSports.com today. That's the letters ILP Sports.com. ILP Sports Consultants, where your well being is the priority and your recovery is the mission. Choose ILP Sports Consultants for a healthier sports journey, helping you get back in the game the smart way. Steve Fidel, former linebacker for the University of Pittsburgh Panthers and the Pittsburgh Steelers, and you're listening to the Total Sports Recall Podcast, a part of the Sports History Network. Now, here's your host, Harv Aronson. Welcome to the Total Sports Recall Podcast, and that intro song you heard was the fight song for the University of Notre Dame. A few weeks back, I interviewed former Steelers punter Craig Colquitt who had won several Super Bowls while playing for Pittsburgh. This episode's guest also won a couple of Super Bowl rings with the Pittsburgh Steelers and a national championship while playing for the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. So I am honored to have as a guest on the show quarterback Terry Hanratty. Like yours truly, Terry Hanratty is a Pittsburgh native who grew up just outside of the city in Butler, Pennsylvania. After playing football at Butler High School, Terry was sought after by several universities as the legendary Bear Bryant tried to persuade him to play his college ball at Alabama. Joe Paterno wanted him to become a litany line at Penn State. Terry's choice was Michigan State, but before he could decide, Eric Pasigian convinced Terry to play football for him at Notre Dame. Terry Hanratty's decision to attend Notre Dame and play quarterback for them was a wise decision as he led the Fighting Irish offense when they became national champions in 1966 and Terry finished 8th in the Heisman Trophy trophy voting. While at Notre Dame, he was awarded the Sammy Baugh Trophy in 1967 and became an All-American in 1968. In 1969, the Pittsburgh Steelers and new head coach Chuck Knoll drafted Terry Hanratty in the second round of the NFL Draft. Terry would remain with the Steelers until 1975, where he and the Steelers won two Super Bowls before he played one final season with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Following football, Terry Hanrady had a successful 35-year career in financial services and spent some time as a sportscaster for ESPN. 
Terry's a proud father of three girls and a son, Connor, who followed in his father's footsteps and played football at Terry's alma mater, Notre Dame. Terry, I'm honored to have you on the show. As a lifelong Steelers fan, I'm thrilled that you accepted my invitation to be a guest and willing to talk about your illustrious past and, of course, Pittsburgh Steelers football. Well, thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm uh, enjoying this reminiscent of Pittsburgh coming up here. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we don't have you on camera, but if you were able to see it, my backdrop behind my studio is the uh, scene of downtown Pittsburgh, so I was hoping you'd be able to get to see that, bring back some old memories. But let's begin with the obvious. I started watching the Steelers when I was 12 years old in 1972, and my exposure to the team was, of all things, the 1972 playoff game with the Oakland Raiders. Back then, the NFL had a rule that if a team failed to sell out a game in their city, the game was blacked out. That was the case for that game in December 72, so I was forced to listen to that game on the radio. All Steeler fans who were following the team in 1972 know what took place in that game. The immaculate reception. Franco Harris picking up a deflected pass that resulted in the Steelers defeating the Raiders 13-7. It was Pittsburgh's first playoff game ever and set the groundwork for a dynasty in the making. I had to listen to that game on the radio, but for you, Terry, you had the best seat in the house. You were on the field. Two questions here. There was so much controversy surrounding that play, and we still do not know if the ball really hit Frenchie Fuqua first. And what are your memories of that game, of that one single play by Franco that has been labeled one of the greatest in NFL history? Well, I really think it was the the greatest. Because when you think about all the big money that's made today, when you see guys making $250 million or whatnot, that catch that Franco made put 5500 bucks into everybody's pocket on that Steelers sign line. (laughs) Seems, seems, Seems like pocket change now. Yeah, but it was you know the traje- trajectory of that ball had to be hit by Tatum. I mean, there's no way that it could have hit Frenchie and bounced that direction because Frenchie was running you know across the field and Tatum was coming up north and south on the field, and the ball shot uh, south. And Franco just happened to be there, and I was right there, and I thought the game was over because Terry did a great job of scrambling back there, and all of a sudden he throws it, and it was just. You know, one of those, he almost got knocked out of bounds. He almost got caught from behind. But it was meant that he was going to make the score. And, and it's a historic event. I mean, that was one of the, you know, in Pittsburgh, four law, you know, that Mazeroski's home runs are the two biggest things that ever happened in this, that city. Oh, absolutely. And that play has been picked apart slow motion over and over again for so many years. And everybody's still trying to determine. And I understand some of the Raiders are still ticked off about that play because they felt like they got ripped off. Well, John, John Matt took that to the grave. I mean, yeah. he, was, he was pissed off the whole time. And Frenchie, to, to this day, is making a living off that play because every, everybody invites him to something and pays him. And he, he keeps telling them he's going to tell them what happened. Yeah. Well, and then at the end of his speech, he says, I really can't tell you now. <laughs> <laughs> so he puts the check in his pocket and uh, goes home. Yeah, I think he said he's going to take he, that to making, the grave. Yeah, he's making that the best of them. Yeah. Well, sadly, Franco passed away this year, and it was sudden. And you obviously lost a great teammate and a friend. Your thoughts about Franco Harris? You know, Franco was, you know, he was such a humble person. I mean, it was, I'll I'll never forget his rookie year when he, you know, he was, uh, he ran for about, I think, three or four straight games, you know, over 100 yards. That's never been done in Pittsburgh. And after about the second or third game, I forget what it was, we're driving out of the ballpark, and I see up ahead, it looks like a guy walking. And I said, Damn, that looks like Franco. Mm-hmm. So we get a little closer, we get a little closer. That is, I stop. I said, what, what's, what are you doing? I said, I'm going home. I said, Why are you, you're not driving? He said, I don't have a car. Oh, my gosh. I said, get in the car here. I'll take you home. Oh, that's hilarious. So here's a guy, I mean, he didn't even think about, you know, buying a car or whatever. Oh, my just, gosh. You know, Franco was just Franco, and it was uh, very humble. He worked really hard. No one saw it how, how often this. You know, when, it, when practice was over, he was doing all his exercise, and he was he, he was great at jumping rope. So you see him back in the, in the back room just mm-hmm. going crazy with that jump rope. Wow. And, uh, I mean, all the work paid off. I mean, he had a great career. Yeah. And, and so you were drafted in the second round 1969 draft after the Steelers picked Joe Green in round one. The following year, for listeners that aren't aware of the story surrounding that draft, The Chicago Bears and Steelers had finished with the worst record the year before, so the overall number one draft pick had to be decided by a coin toss. And Art Rooney won the toss, drafted Bradshaw, who would become starter until he retired. Looking back, Terry, at that 1970 draft, were you aware Chuck Knoll was going to select Bradshaw if the Steelers won that coin toss? And was there any part of you hoping that George Hallis would win the flip? 
Because if he went, he had won that coin toss, I believe you would have been the starting quarterback and not Terry Bradshaw. Well, it, it uh, you know it's something you know it's all all in the past, and at the time, you know, I was I was in the National Guard, and our rookie, my rookie year in '69. You know, you know, we had a lot of success in our national championship. I think the worst season we had was with two two losses. And we come to Pittsburgh, and I was one in thirteen. And I got I got the hell kicked out of me. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> you know, a long, long year. Yeah, we were one in thirteen. We won the first game of the year. Then we lost thirteen straight. Oh my god! And after after that, I had to go into basic training for the National Guard. Oh no! So I had no thought of football because I'm down in you know, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, with the eighty second Airborne, and you know. Well, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and all these bivouacs and one of those shooting ranges and all that stuff. And Chuck Noll called me, and, and I get, I'm in my barracks, and I, you know, I go, Terry, you got a call down there. I say, the guy said it's Chuck Noll. I don't know if that's true or not. I thought it was playing a joke. <laughs> but he called me, you know, he called me and said, listen, we just drafted Terry Bradshaw, and, you know, it's not, he said, we thought you had a really good rookie year, but, you know, competition brings the best out of everybody. Sure. And I, and I believe that, you know, I would have, mm-hmm. even if, even if there was free agency back then, I don't know if I'd have left because I made so many great friends with, on the team and with the, the, with the ownership and the fans of Pittsburgh that, uh, I really felt comfortable and I, you know, competed every year for the job. And, mm-hmm. we, you know, I started in 69, Terry and I split the time 71 and 2, I believe. Yeah. You know, then he then he won the job, and uh, we just kept helping one another. And I think that's, you know, the best way to go, and it's the best man. You know, I, I beat out guys in high school, I beat out guys in college, I beat, you know, beat out my rookie year in Pittsburgh, you know, then, uh, so it was 1 for 5, or, or oh for, 4 for 5, anyway, there. Yeah. So it was, uh, it turned out well. I mean, I was on two, you know, two phenomenal teams. Sure. And I think it was 74 they had some controversy about the starting quarterback because isn't that the year that Joe Gillum beat out Bradshaw for a short time? Yeah, it was, yeah. you know, Joe, it was interesting because it was sort of a quagmire there because, you, know, you know, I was supposed to be the old quarterback, uh, you know, in my second year in the league you know, when Terry came in. And then Joe came in. We had three young quarterbacks. I mean, it was, mm-hmm. you know. Pretty, pretty crazy to have that, that kind of. Usually, you'd like to have a seasoned veteran with, you know, a young quarterback. That would be the ultimate yeah. solution to, to that. But you know, what didn't happen. But again, you know, Joe was Joe had a great arm. Joe's mm-hmm. only problem was that Joe didn't know anything about the running game. Yeah, and, he, and I said, try to help us. Said Joe, you can't just throw the ball. You got to run the ball. You gotta, you know, <laughs> put it. He says, he said, we Terry. He says, Joe Gilly does doesn't run the ball. Joe oh Gilly throws gosh. the ball. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Dick Anderson picked him off a few times. Uh-huh. But uh, you know he had a great arm, and it was you know back and forth, and it's you know it finally settled down after a while. Well, before we get back to football, Joe Gillum is a sad story. I mean, obviously everybody that knows him knows he had the drug problem. Um, ended up, I think, homeless at one point. And I was curious, did he ever reach out to anybody and ask for help? No, no, it was mm-hmm. that's, that was an era where nobody looked for help. Hmm. And then it was just sad because Joe was very bright, very mm-hmm. funny, yeah. and a good athlete. You know, he yeah. had everything going for him. But, uh, you know, when that devil gets in you, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get out. And sometimes, you know, someone, any addicts, you know, some people can recover. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one trip to the rehab, some five trips to the rehab. Yeah. And some people's bottom is death. And that's sad to say, but, you know, that's the truth. And, you know, Joe, I consider a good friend and mm-hmm. uh, sad, sad time because he did run into some, you know, Rocky Rose along, along the way. Yeah, and it's, I, if I remember right, he had recovered, but then he went back to it and that actually ended up what was what, what killed him in the end. Um, right. so it's quite unfortunate. But, uh, Terry, you were part of two of uh, the four Super Bowl teams that won the NFL title four times in six years, thus creating one of the great football dynasties in history. That must make you proud, being a member of such great teams. I mean, if you look back at who was on those teams, it's breathtaking to me, the amount of immense talent and all the future Hall of Famers making up those four Super Bowl teams. And there, there are many. It's, it's sad because there are as many guys that are in the Hall of Fame, there should be a few more. I mean, Elsie Greenwood, it's a, it's a shame that he is not in the Hall of Fame. Elsie was a phenomenal defensive end, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he and Jack Lambert playing on the same side together made a great tandem. Yep. And uh, John Colvin offense, mm-hmm. I mean, John is, you know, yeah, I think went the whole season without it, you know, like giving up yeah. even a pressure on a quarterback. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, there's a couple, and a couple other guys that are very close. 
And uh, but those two especially, yeah, I think should be in the Hall of Fame. But but if you look at that defense, I mean, that's absolutely insane. I mean, oh yeah, and, and, and I got to practice against them every day. So, yeah, you know, I knew how, I knew how good they really were. They weren't allowed to hit me. That's the good part about it. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. I said, if Mel Blunt ever get his hands on you, because boy, he could hit. <laughs> no, 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 Mel, I had had. I couldn't touch quarterback back then. Yeah, and I'll tell you, you're right about L.C. Greenwood. I've been crying that for years. I mean, this this guy belongs in the Hall of Fame then, again and again and over and again. I mean, I just it's a travesty that he's not in the Hall of Fame. I just don't know, get why they can't put him in. And all the great fronts in, in defense and yeah. throughout the league mm-hmm. over the years, I mean, there are more than one every front four. That are in the Hall of Fame except for Pittsburgh. Just Joe is the only one of the four, and obviously deserved, well deserved. But yeah, but no, no one else. LC should be also be in that just because of that, mm-hmm. because he was the second most dominating person in that front four. What? And that front four was really good. Yeah, because that's back. In, that's back in the day. We rarely blitzed mm-hmm. because that front four put enough pressure on the quarterback oh, yeah. that we could, we could loosen up the linebackers to get into pass coverage. Uh-huh. So we never never had really had the blitz. Yeah, and. and- so with some of the guys that make the Hall of Fame today, based on what who they're putting in today, you could easily make an argument for Dwight White, John Colby, you're right, belongs in there. There's a lot of players that we had that could absolutely be in there based on how they vote to these days. Yeah, I agree. So, so I asked Craig Colquitt the same question, but you had the opportunity to actually play for Art Rooney Sr. And as I grew up in Pittsburgh, I never met the Chief, but I can speak for many Pittsburghers. And I'm sure that even if you ever met the man living in Pittsburgh, we felt like we knew him personally. He was like a grandfather type of figure to everyone. The people in Pittsburgh just loved this man. I can still see Pete Rizal handing him the Super Bowl trophy in Super Bowl IX. And anyone watching, if they fail to get choked up with happy emotions watching that, then they did not understand the impact that Art Rooney Sr. had on Steelers fans and all those associated with the National Football League. He was so highly respected. Your impression of having played and personally known Art Rooney Sr.? Well, people often ask me, you know, what's the best memory you have of Pittsburgh? And I say, you know, outside of the actual field of play, it was that exact moment that you mentioned there. And after Super Bowl IX, and Art Rooney's up on the stage with Pete Rosell and Chuck Knowles up there and some Mm -hmm. newscasters, I forget which one. And him accepting that trophy, that's after 40 years Mm -hmm. of not doing, you know, not even getting close to anything like that. And all of a sudden, you know, there he was, you know, accepting that trophy. That's, uh, you're right. Everybody had a, had a tear in their eye because, yes. you know, he, he was just, you never knew from his expression whether you won or lost. Uh-huh. He, he would come into the locker room after every game, whether win or lose, and just mm-hmm. go around, pat everybody on the back and say, nice game, nice game. You mm-hmm. guys tried hard. You tried hard. You know, just a, just a true gentleman and a wonderful person. Yeah. And it, and it, and it really filters down. You know, Dan Rooney, you know, God rest his soul, he also also died on us. Sure. You know, he was the same thing. I mean, they mm-hmm. were just absolutely wonderful people to work for. And then, you know, then uh, Artie uh, the third owns, owns, runs the team now. Yeah. And it's, it's the same thing. I mean, the mm-hmm. whole Rooney family from, from top to bottom are just up, absolutely wonderful people, and it was a privilege to work for them. Yeah, and for those that don't know, I remember reading that Art Rooney used to actually walk down to the stadium from his home. So, oh, he lived right on the hill. Yeah, crazy. Um, and so Craig Colquitt told me a, a neat little story about Art Rooney Sr. When he first started playing, Art was still there, and he brought his young son in, and he was in the locker room, and Art Rooney walked over to Craig Colquitt and looked at his son and says, oh, who do we have here? And Craig told him who it was, and he says, oh, you're going to be a superstar one day, and he autographed something for him. Turns out Craig Colquitt's son, well, actually both of them, went on to play as punters in the NFL. Both of them won Super Bowls as well. So it's pretty. That's, a, that's the punning Colquitt. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, they're everywhere. Yeah, well, the three of them are going to come on the show supposedly when the season's over. So we'll see if that happens. He's going to try to get both his sons on with himself. That'll be pretty neat. Uh, so, that'd be nice. Yeah. So I, I wanted to ask you, Terry. I once heard about something called a 500 club when I was growing up with the Steelers, and it was during your time with them. A club that reportedly consisted of four players on a team that could bench press 500 pounds or more. Is that a oh, myth? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wondering if that's a myth or did it really exist? I tell people that story because I heard it somewhere, and I don't know if it's true. Well, you had John Culp. Yeah. You had Mike Webster. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think those are the only two that could do it. I mean, Larry yeah. Brown was 
really, really strong. But Larry yeah. was six five. Right. You know, Webby's lucky to be six feet. Well, and I, and I, I used to go in the weight room and just bust chops in there. I act. You know, I, I, and I'd say, what's going on here? I said, listen, yeah. Larry should get, should get some kind of a boat here. <laughs> because, because, you know, he's, he's got to push the thing about eight inches longer than you yeah. guys do. Well, so I would be shocked if Larry benched, yeah. benched uh, 500. Because he just had to push it up further than everybody else. Well, I actually... But definitely, but definitely Kolb and Webster. Yeah. Well, I actually heard the, 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 the name of your Notre Dame teammate and Stewart's teammate. I actually heard Rocky Blyer was that strong and he could do it. So. No, no, no. <laughs> well, then, it, then it's a myth. <laughs> yeah, it's a myth. That's a myth. So, while you played one final season in the NFL, it came with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 1976, their first year in the league, and they finished without winning a single game, losing all 14. You were a backup to legendary college coach, Steve Spurrier, who was starting the quarterback for John McKay's Bucks. I know you didn't play a lot that season. I'm not sure how long you were even on the team, but what was that experience like? Well, I was there for the last 10 weeks. And I, no one saw the NFL like I did. My rookie year, I, we were one and thirteen. My last year with Tampa, we were zero and fourteen. <laughs> oh my God. Two, year, two years in the middle, Super Bowl champions. So no one, no one saw the NFL like I did. Wow. <laughs> you know, it was it was. Uh, you got to practice in shorts. That's for sure. <laughs> but it was uh, it, it was. You knew you weren't going to win anything. Yeah. And Steve and I became good friends, and uh, oh, cool. you know, we had uh, McKay came to me before a Steeler game. Yeah, and he said, "Listen, it'd be good for football to have you start this week." And I wanted to say, "Who the hell did you talk to?" <laughs> and uh, so I got I started the game in Pittsburgh, and that's you know they were on a roll, but you know they didn't go to the Super Bowl that year, but uh, they were still very good. And yeah. we didn't cross the 50. Oh, my God. And Joe Green would blow through the line and grab me and lay me down. <laughs> Green would, would grab me and lay me down. He didn't want to hit you? <laughs> it, it, was, it was crazy. Oh, well, that's and funny. And at halftime, McKay gets in there and says, listen, he said, Terry, dude, let's see if Steve can't get something going in the second half here. Yeah. And they, they kicked his ass. Oh, my God. And he, <laughs> he came off the field and said, boy, your boys took good care of you. And he said, they're kicking my ass. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll tell you, the, the Steelers back then, that defense, they intimidated opponents. I mean, there was teams, I think, that were really seriously afraid to face that Steelers defense because they were so brutal. No, they were. They couldn't play today. Yeah. yeah they, they'll be out of the game in the first quarter. Exactly. Exactly. I miss that, to tell you the truth. As a longtime football fan, I miss the old days of how they used they've to really, play. They really, yeah, they, they've really, you know, I can see concussions are horrible. I mean, I've been, you know, my share of concussion, but thank yeah. God, you know, there's nothing that's mm-hmm. been lasting. But the guys that, that are lasting, it's good that they try to take care of the head area. Yeah. But th- now they just get to the point where if you even come close to someone's head, there are some there are some calls on on Tom Brady when he was playing. Mm-hmm. And I've got you got to be kidding me. They must okay. say, well, he's 45 years old. I said, hell, anybody can play to 45 if they didn't get hurt. Yeah. Or, or didn't get hit. I mean, the rules the rules are ridiculous. We'll get to talk about Steers in a little bit here, but last weekend's game, I think it was George Pickens got called for um, misconduct or whatever because he put his finger to his mouth like, shh. And I was like, and he got flagged for that 15 yards. I'm like, that is so stupid. I mean, it made no sense. Yeah, it looks like there's no real consistency of, you know, when, no. when they're going to call a holding penalty, when they're going to yeah. call something like that. You know, it's, it's uh they got to take a good look at the rule book again. Sure. Well, let's go back to your days at Notre Dame now. You played alongside Rocky Blyer, who would be your teammate on the Steelers as well. Many right. people knew Rocky's story about his injuries in Vietnam and how he was told he would no longer play football, but he came to the Steelers and had an immensely successful career. Your thoughts about being a teammate with Rocky Blyer twice? Yeah, Rocky was a year ahead of me at Notre Dame. He was our captain his senior year with my junior year. And, you know, we were all very dear friends. And, you know, when he came to Pittsburgh, back, you know, that was back in the height of the Vietnam War. Mm-hmm. You know, so each each city in the country would hold back about three or four slots on local uh, National Guard outfits to get their top, top draft choices mm-hmm. into the National Guard so they don't have to go active duty. And Rocky was, you know, he was 16th round pick. Back, you know, now they have, what, seven? Yeah, seven rounds. Six, six, 16 rounds. Yeah. And uh, 
so you know they didn't. He wasn't. He, Rocky was not fast. You know, he was not big, not strong, and no one thought he'd ever make the team. Mm-hmm. So they did not, you know, offer him a, a slot in the National Guard. So he ended up making the team. Had a really good rookie year. Played special teams, and uh, you know, got to carry the ball a few times. Did well. Made the team, obviously. And then, right then, at the end of the year, he got he got called. Got the letter from Uncle Sam. And he had to go. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget that. Uh, then fast forward one year, you know, I'm in, I'm in, up in La Trobe, my rookie year, and uh, spring, summer practice, and Chuck Noll comes into the meeting room, and a very somber look on his face. Yeah. And, and I just want to let you guys know that one of our teammates, Rocky Blyer, was shot in Vietnam. We don't oh. know how bad it was and whatnot. Oh my God. And you could hear a pin drop in a room. Yeah. Rocky had only been there a year. And that's that's uh-huh. that's that's what he did to the team in just that one year he was there. Wow. And and it was a very somber practice the whole the, the whole afternoon. Yeah. And, and uh, when he came back from Vietnam, he stayed with my family and I for a while. Mm-hmm. And we'd work out every day. And I kept telling him, I said, "What the hell are you doing?" He, he had a horrible, horrible limp. Wow. And he just got off his cane. He had a bad limp. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I try, re, re, try to run some plays. I hand him the ball off and he, you know, try to run off tackle or something. He just limp, 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 limp. I'm saying, Rock, wow. you know, give it up, man. Mr. Rooney, Art Rooney, told him, he said, listen, he said, I'll, I'll pay for your uh, law school mm-hmm. at Duquesne, Duquesne University. Mm-hmm. He says, I'll pay for everything. You don't have to play football. Wow. And, no, no, I want to. I want to play. I, wanna, I kept telling, tell, take Mr. Rooney up on his offer. Mm-hmm. No, no, I want to make it back. I want to make it back. Wow. And I'll be damned. He rushed for a thousand yards one year. Yep. He and Franco, hard, right? Hard to imagine. That's the yeah. That's yep. a great uh, fighting back with a book they wrote. You know, he wrote, yep. and uh, that was it. I don't know if you saw the documentary that he did recently about going back to Vietnam. Going back to Vietnam. I oh that, my yeah. God! I watched that. It was so touching. It was a great documentary. Uh, really good. Really well done. Um, but 1966, you led the Fighting Irish to a nine zero one record. The only blemish was a tie with Michigan State, score ten ten. One of those victories that season came against your hometown university, the Panthers of the University of Pittsburgh. Your team smashed the Panthers, though, 40 to nothing. The Irish would win the national championship, but you missed the game against USC, I noticed, when your team won 51 nothing as Coley O'Brien replaced your quarterback. What was your injury, and what did that championship Chris season... Won that t- in that 10-10 tie in the first quarter, Papa Smith separated my shoulder. That's who hit you? And, yep. Yeah, oh, my Bubba God. Got the, Bubba got the, got the good shot on me and knocked me out of the game. And, uh, wow. I told him, I said, what do you think we would have played? I said, oh, you guys would have had 10, but we would have had 35. Yeah. But uh, to this day, I say, if you go through those two teams, that's the two best teams to ever play each other. I mean, you look on the you look on yeah. the, both sides of the, the Michigan State, Notre Dame, mm-hmm. the All-Americans, the Hall of Famers, the, mm-hmm. you know, the all-AFL, AF, remember the old AFL? Yeah, absolutely. Merger? Yep. You know, George Webster was the, the number one linebacker in the old AFL. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, just a lot of talent. And those two, that was one hard knock game. You know, but I'm most wow. of the game, three, three quarters, I'm on the sideline with a cast on my shoulder. Oh, my gosh. So so, so yeah. I couldn't play the next weekend. We went out and stumped. And whatever, um, whatever became of Coley O'Brien, he replaced you for that game. Yeah, Coley, you know, the next year he switched to halfback. Oh, okay. And uh, then it was... Then Theisman was my backup. Oh my gosh, then, that's uh, funny. Then uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, then then uh, you know, Coley is an attorney and he's retired now. He's an attorney in Washington. Well, good. D.C. Yeah. where he's from. Excellent. Well, that 1966 season, you threw for 1,247 yards, eight touchdowns. Your quarterback rating was an impressive 128.7. You finished eighth in the Heisman Trophy voting as Steve Spurrier actually won the award. Uh, and ironically enough, you'd be backing him up in Tampa during your final season. However, Time Magazine puts you on the cover, Terry, in 1966 with the label The Power of Talent and Teamwork with your primary receiver, Jim Seymour, also pictured. And I found it the other day, sent it to you, I couldn't believe it. That was the craziest thing. You became the youngest athlete to ever appear on the cover of their magazine at that time. 1966 was an incredibly special year for you, uh, especially in your football career. What did that Time Magazine cover photo mean to you? Well, I was a little embarrassed, number one. <laughs> I, was, I, I was 18 years old. Yeah. 
you know, most of when you see these quarterbacks look like, you know, the kid at the heart of Notre Dame now, you know, well, he's done a great job as well. He's 24 years old. Wow. You know, <laughs> a little, little different from, you know, I just, I'm, I'm a year away from high school football, you know. Yeah. Because you, you, you didn't play. Well, if you put it this way, this is the interesting part of the whole thing. When I was at Butler High School, it was still one of the best, one of the best eras of football in the country with the, were, with the teams I played on the, the, up there. And, and I didn't start at quarterback until my senior year. And we lit it up. We scored 299 points in, in nine games. And we won eight and one. Mm. And then Notre Dame, you can't, couldn't back then, you couldn't play as a freshman. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all you did was scrimmage of varsity on, yeah. on uh, Monday, which was, the, we'll call it the toilet bowl, because you got to <laughs> all the guys that did bad on Saturday or didn't play at all, so they're all yeah. bad. They're all pissed off. Wow. And so if you look at it, I, I started nine games at quarterback in high school. Mm. My, tenth, my tenth game was at Notre Dame on national TV against mm. Bob Greasy, we wow. were the number two ranked team, and they were number four ranked team in the country. Yeah, and we still beat them. Wow, two, two for three and no picks, and uh, we beat them twenty six fourteen. I think it was uh, that that started out for the the run for the national championship. Wow. So, how did Time Magazine decide on you, or how did they find you? Did they notify my you? Looks. My looks. <laughs> <laughs> that was without your mustache, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, no mustache back then. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no! Uh, I mean, we we were having that you know, that miracle year because yeah. you know, Notre Dame is coming off of you know sixty four. We were almost won the national championship, but they uh-huh. got screwed out in a uh, bogus call on California, or something sure. else, or we'd have won the national championship that year. Wow! But you know, then sixty five. You know, we didn't have a really talented quarterback, and. uh so, you know, we were just a running team, and, you know, beat, beat teams by defense. Mm-hmm. Then, then the explosion, and, you know, we, the way we opened up the year against Purdue, then, you know, went on to carry on with, uh, and about the sixth year, six, you know, they said, well, we got to, you know, it's the power of Notre Dame. If I was at any other school, I probably would have been on the local magazine. Yeah. But in Notre Dame, everybody wants to, you know, the, they got the national national look there, so they wanted, they wanted to put Jim and I on the cover, but Notre Dame didn't want us on the cover, because yeah. they said we had we have a lot of seniors there that are well deserved. Mm-hmm. Nick Eddy and Larry Conjar and mm-hmm. you know Jim Lynch and Duranko and all these guys were phenomenal football players. Yeah. And uh, Time said no, we want to, but so they, Notre Dame would not allow them to take a photograph from Notre Dame's deal. So they ended up doing their own drawing of Jim and I on the cover of the yeah. magazine. Yeah. So they could get around Notre Dame. But, you know, it, of course, you know, you, you come out, you know, it was the first personal, you know, interview national, nationwide I'd ever had, you mm-hmm. know, so it was, mm-hmm. and you knew that all these guys on the team were much deser- much more deserving than you were because, you know, I had a great offensive line, and the quarterback sure. can't throw the ball unless they have a great offensive line. So, I, yeah. and, you know, every team, every win I've ever had has been 11 guys winning, and the defense getting us the ball in the right position. Absolutely. So, so it's, uh, it was a little embarrassing, but, you know, the older you get, the better it feels. Did you still have a copy of the magazine? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, got, uh, I figured you would. They put it, uh, laminated and sent, sent you one way back when. Excellent. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, growing up, too, uh, I remember Notre Dame just being such a powerhouse. But I do remember watching Tony, being from Pittsburgh, you know, I became a big Pitt fan because I lived there. I remember Tony Dorsett running wild on Notre Dame. I think he had 333 yards rushing or something like that. I don't know if you remember that game. I'm sure you do. Well, he, he went over four straight years. There's another funny part about it. Four straight years he rushed for over 200 yards against Notre Dame. Wow. His senior year in high school, Hopewell High School. Yeah. They played my old high school, Butler. Uh-huh. And they held him to 54 yards rushing. No kidding. Yes. Wow. Then he gets... the next year he goes over 200 against Notre Dame. <laughs> he was a special player, though. He was... He was... I mean, I, I, you probably don't know the... Notre Dame in a 20 year period has 60, I'm sorry, Butler in a 20 year period has 62 Division I football players. Wow, that's amazing. And the Butler is a town of about 15,000. Yeah. And here's another one I love to tell people, no one could figure this one out. And, you know, we, we didn't have Pop Warner, we had Little League, which was inner, inner city Butler. 
Baltimore, right? Yeah. So, wherever you lived, what section, you know, the same, same, you know, as a pie, there's six different pieces of that pie. And Butler was, you know, where I lived was one piece of the pie. Yeah. So, whatever piece of the pie you, you lived in, that's the team you played for. Oh. And it was called In- Institute Hill. Wow. My, my eighth grade team, uh-huh. right? So, the, we're really diluting the 15,000 people. We get down to one section of the pie. Now, hmm. in my backfield, three out of the four guys in my backfield played at least eight years in the pros. No kidding. Yep. What, any- Myself, I played eight. And twins, Rich and Ron Saul, uh-huh. played uh, 12 and 13 years. Richie played 12 years for the Rams, was a center. I remember uh, Ron Saul. Uh, oh, that's, that's Rich, is it, who played for the Rams. Yeah. His brother, twin brother, Rich. They both played at Michigan State. Okay. I played against my college. Uh-huh. And... Richie played center for the Rams. He was all pro for about seven or eight years. Yep. And Ronnie was the original uh, uh, hog down there in Washington. Mm -hmm. And older brother Bill played for the Steelers and played for Detroit, played for Penn State. Wow. So they had had, uh, their their family played about, uh, let's see, 25, 35, close to 40 years experience in the pros, a small family. Wow. 12, 13, and Bill was about 12, too, something like that. And you're speaking of a Butler in that area, and it was in, I thought I had put it in my notes, but I just, it, you just reminded me of it because I was going to bring it up. But the whole quarterback, Western Pennsylvania quarterback thing, I mean, it's amazing. I know I read an article on you. You said it was something in the water. It must be the reason why. But John, Johnny Unitas and Dan Marino, yourself, um, Montana, Montana uh, Jim Kelly. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. What is it to that? George Blanda. George Blanda. What is it about that? Johnny Lujak. Yeah, Johnny Johnny Lujak really surprised me. I had no idea he was from that area. Oh, there's a bunch more too. I mean, it's 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 you know everybody asking that question, and it's it's really an interesting thing because what you have in Western Pennsylvania, and you know you're from Pittsburgh. Yeah. And you have it's all back in the day, especially back in my day. Mm -hmm. It was coal mines and steel mills. Yep. And those guys who worked in coal mines and steel mills were tough bastards. Yeah. And t- tough guys breed tough kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And tough kids play football. Absolutely. So every town had their football team. And, you know, that was that was it. that was the coming out party every Friday night. You could steal sure. everybody's house. The one that they would steal, but everybody mm-hmm. was at the football game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And every team had to have a quarterback. Yep. You know, so it was, uh, it was, uh, and everybody knew that the way out of that coal mine and steel mill was through a football scholarship because very few of us could afford uh, sure. scholar or tuition to college. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you had to get the scholarship to get the hell out, and that's what uh, that's what you that what you strive for. That. Yeah, you ain't kidding. When I, I, I graduated from North Hills High School, and that was it. Every Friday night, that's where everybody was, Martorelli Stadium in North Hills, and yep. I'm going out to watch our team. And, uh, yeah, so I know what you're talking about when you're talking about Friday nights in Pittsburgh. Absolutely. Um, so I know you've seen the movie, but regarding Rudy, I did a podcast recently about true sports movies, and this was near the top of my list. I have read some of that movie. Uh, some of the movie and other parts are. I've heard that they're not factual. The scene where players turned in their jerseys so Rudy could suit up for the final game of his college career. So a three part question here, Terry. One, what was your opinion of the movie? Two, what do you know how about how factual it was? And sadly, it's true that Rudy is the only, is it only he the only player to ever be carried off the field at Notre Dame by teammates? And have you ever met Rudy Rudiger? Uh, uh, so back with uh, yes, I've met Rudy many times. Uh, what was the first part of the question? So I wanted to know um, whether or not the it was factual that the players actually turned their jerseys in so that he could play. Oh, no, they did not turn their jerseys <laughs> in. In fact, Dan Devine was upset. Dan, Dan was pissed off. Really? You know, he yeah. died a few years after that you know, yeah. the whole debacle. But you know, he said that if anybody would have thrown their – they would have been off the team. <laughs> and that oh, that never happened. <laughs> and, and Leave it to Hollywood. Was, Montana was there, and he said that that he didn't see. He had a couple drunk buddies from the stands <laughs> got onto the field and carry Rudy. Oh no, you serious? Oh my god! There was no, it was no players. The, the 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 movie was sort of like the same as most sports movies. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're embellished. Uh-huh. You know, there's a, a lot of that movie that you know. I thought it was a very entertaining movie. I yeah. thought it was very well written. You got to give yeah. a lot of credit. Sure. Because Rudy went out 
and sold the thing to Mary Tyler Moore Productions by himself. He banged all around Hollywood. <laughs> he got no, 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 no. Wow. Finally, okay, let's do it. And, you know, it was a very successful movie. Yeah. But it's like any movie. I mean, Rocky, you know, fighting back, there was a lot of there that you go, whoa. Yeah. And they had me getting in a fight with Joe Green in the, in the locker room. Uh, maybe I should take it out of my top <laughs> ten. <laughs> that, that, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, what about Rudy Rudiger, the real Rudy? Tell me a little bit about him, that what you know about or we can tell about him. No, uh, I don't know. I, I've only met him. I mean, I, yeah. I don't know him that well. I, mean, I hear sure. he's a good guy and all that good stuff, but yeah. you know, I just said enough to say hello to him and yeah. like movie and all that good stuff. All right, well, let's talk about the current day Pittsburgh Steelers. What's your opinion of Kenny Pickett? And I want to know what you think is going to take the Steelers, what's going to take to get the Steelers back to another Super Bowl? Well, they're going to have Cincy and uh, Cleveland and, and Baltimore. Yeah, uh-huh. Get, get, get a little mishaps there. No, I think yeah, it's for, they're playing in the toughest conference. Sure. And, you know, without Hayward on defense, I mean, it's not going to, when he finally gets healthy and comes back, that's mm-hmm. going to be a heck of a plug for that, for that defense. I think it's going to be, obviously yeah. going to be a lot, a lot better. But, you know, they, they still have to, it's like so many teams, whether at every level, still struggling to find an offensive line. Sure. And until, you know, I haven't seen a quarterback yet that could throw the ball from his ass. Yeah. Uh-huh. And you got to protect the quarterback, and you sure. got to get a running game, and mm-hmm. you got to have both of them. And a lot of it, you know, you get around it by with play selection by the coordinator. Mm-hmm. And you know, I haven't studied enough. Long, I know everybody wants Canada Canada fire, but yeah. it's probably not that bad. Right. And it's just a matter of you know, you call the play if it doesn't work. You know, it's so all of a sudden it's your fault when it's you know there's a lot of people around sure. that, that should take blame for that. But you know, I think pick it'll be good. I mean, I. I, I think he, you know, it's another one. You know, came in. I think he was about twenty-four years old. He had a lot of sure. a lot of experience mm-hmm. in college, and he's, he's been through a lot of situations. So I think he's a better suited person than most kids that come out with you after know, normal three or four years. Well, I don't know if you heard that before the draft, where this this crazy talk was that his hands were too small to play in the NFL. Uh, I said it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I mean, after I kept hearing that. I went and measured my hands because I didn't know they were supposed to be bigger or not. Yeah. I don't know. But that's, I, that's a, it was a stupid big, thing to say. I mean, it's ridiculous. Than his hand, but, it, you know, I, I think it's, I find it interesting that he wears gloves year round. Yeah. Because, mm. what the, you know, the, the gloves they make nowadays are very, that's why these kids make all, I mean, they're great receivers, but they make a mm. lot of the catches because of that stick them on the gloves. Exactly. The, nat- the natural stick that's on that leather. Right, right. And, and uh, I think that's maybe the way Pickett gets around mm-hmm. not being able to grip the ball with a smaller hand. I don't know. For, you know, I'm just guessing. Yeah. That he has the tackiness of those gloves where mm-hmm. he can, you know, easily get, get you know, throw with them. Well, a friend of mine, he went to a Penguins game. He said they were chanting Fire Matt Canada at the Penguins game. I'm like, oh, wow. That, wow. that's just overboard. <laughs> that's overboard. Um, yeah, but, that, that poor bastard. I, I don't know. I hope, I hope he doesn't go out to dinner in Pittsburgh. I'm telling you, and and then <laughs> and, uh, you know, he got a vote of confidence from uh, I just saw from Roethlisberger. Oh, did he? Week. Yeah, he said he's calling a good game, but you know, stay off. You know, stay off. People stay off and whatnot. Well, in some previous, you got to let you got to let people grow. Yeah. Uh huh. And in previous podcasts, I had this discussion. I'm mean, like, still, you know, everybody agrees that you've got to still execute. The players have to execute, and it's not always about the play calling. If they're not running the plays or making their blocks, um, it's not going to work, and then it's going to come down on the offensive coordinator, whereas if they didn't execute, you know, you have to execute. Um, I know a podcast here in Pittsburgh, they, um, the Steelers podcast I listened to, uh, this guy said that it would be – completely wrong if Broderick Jones did not start last weekend and he didn't so he thought it, Mike Tom would be making a major mistake if Broderick Jones didn't start and Daniel Moore started in place of him and I thought he did a pretty good job right um, yeah well I think they played very well last week yeah I mean, it was really, really good yeah I thought they were actually going to be much better than they were last year I still think they can turn the corner and have a good season TJ Watt is just so much fun to watch that kid yeah he is and High Smith is having a great yeah, year also so exactly you got bookends there, so they can't run away from one. Exactly. Uh, you got you got people on both sides, and, and what, again, once you, once you get Hayward in there, yeah, you know, the, the, I think the interior is playing very well. Mm-hmm. But what it'll do is that that builds that builds depth. When you get a guy like Hayward in there, then all of a 
calls than the guy who may be coming out has had a lot of reps yeah. and he's ready to you know spell anybody there and you don't have anything drop off. So did you watch the game last weekend? You saw that? Oh, yeah. The yeah, number of Steeler fans in Los Angeles was just the most outrageous. My, do- my daughter lives in Los Angeles. She went to the game? And, and she got her tickets for the game. Wow. And she texted me and said, Dad, there's 75% Steeler fans here. That's crazy. <laughs> and they, they showed all the terrible towels flying. And yep. even the announcer said, you know, this is crazy. It looks like a home game for Pittsburgh. Absolutely. I was watching. I was just but amazed. You know, they did, a, they did a survey years ago that there's more Steeler bars in the country than any other team. Oh, yeah. There's, there's no doubt about it. We have the best yeah. fan base around. And I'll tell you another story, Terry. I, I, I went to a game here in Jacksonville years ago, and I called a local radio host because he was talking about how many Stewart fans were going to be in Jacksonville Stadium. And I said, and he was saying five, ten thousand. 10,000. I called him up and I said, are you crazy? I said, there'll be at least 35,000 fans there, if not more. And I went to the game, and I looked around. I was like, Jesus, oh, my God. That Almost the whole stadium was Stewart fans. I called him the back, back the next day, and I said to him, because he was talking about Steelers Nation's a myth. It's not as big as everybody thinks it is. And so I had a pretty big mailing list at the time. I gave everybody his email address and told him to email him and tell how much of a Steelers myth it is. I called him two days later, and he said, would you please stop? Our, in, our mailbox is blowing up. We had like 800 emails. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So um, I'm going to switch sports here. I have one non-football question for you, Terry. My first love was baseball, and I clearly remember the 1971 World Series, which is solely responsible for my falling in love with sports because I can still see the great Roberto Clemente rounding the bases, Game 7 of that World Series, hitting a home run. He instantly became my boyhood hero, and his tragic and untimely death in 1972 came as a shock to all of baseball, especially people of Pittsburgh. And to this day, I still can't wrap my head around the fact that he's gone. Pittsburgh loved Roberto Clemente nearly as much as Art Rooney Sr., and he was just a fine human being. Did you ever get the opportunity to meet Roberto? Oh yeah, for for sure. Mm-hmm. We had you know, back when when they built th- uh, Three Rivers. You know that was back in the day when they built stadiums. Everybody they built stadiums for both their baseball and football, which means you had a horrible baseball field and a horrible football field. Mm-hmm. It, it solved no no problem. Yeah. You know, no solution for the fans or the players. Horrible. Sure. You know that's that turf they had, and what and that was back well, obviously well before cell phones. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I lived out in the suburbs, and, uh, you know, I would come down to the stadium to see if there's anybody around to catch the ball. Mm -hmm. Well, the Pirates are in town, and, you know, they're out in the field taking batting practice, and I go out in the field, and it turns out where they were being, they would run my pass patterns for me. (laughs) And I would would go to the play, because my first love was baseball also. Yeah. And I would take batting practice. Wow! So they would run, they would run pass patterns for me, and the, uh-huh. you know they had the Dodgers one time, and I forget it was uh, it wasn't uh, Drysdale, it, was, it wasn't maybe it was Sutton. One of those guys was running pass patterns. Yeah, and here comes Paul uh, Olson out yelling and screaming, "You're gonna break your effing finger, <laughs> get out of here, you dumbass!" And yelling, screaming. <laughs> but you know they liked playing, you know, because most of them played high school football. Sure. So they, they wanted to throw the football around and catch the pass, pass batters, and I needed someone to run, you know, one to lose my arm up. Then afterwards, I said, okay, enough, enough football. Let me, let me take some batting practice. So I got in the, and I still had, I got, I was back, I was down to the warning track power. In the old days, I could have put it out, but, uh, wow. <clears throat> but I, I hit you know, the warning track, but it was fun. And, and it was, that was, you know, they turned out to be my, mm-hmm. be my receivers. And so you, but you got a chance and to Clemente, meet Roberto. Clemente, Roberto never ran any pass passes. But yeah, we met, you know, met many times just to say hello. Wow, but yeah. what a great player! I mean, you got and people don't understand when they, you got to go back to the archives and see what when he when he gets a ball in the deep in the right field corner. Oh God! And he throws it on the line, on the fly, uh-huh. to third base. Yeah, bang. And I read something somewhere where he used to, in practice, just have his back to home plate, and he would field the ball off the wall, and without looking, just turn around and keep practicing throwing to home plate. So he was always right on the money when he had to make a, a put out at home plate. Yeah. And I know he used right. to also made a practice of when a guy would hit a single to right field and round the base, he would throw back to the first baseman, and sometimes yes. he caught the guy off the base, and he throw would behind him. Yeah. Or, if it was a slow runner, it was a slow hit. He tried to throw him out at first. He yeah. done that before. 
Well, we had a baseball podcast a few weeks back, and we were discussing, my guest and I, about the fact that they are talking about retiring the number 21 throughout of all of baseball, but there's some pushback on that because they don't want to outshine Jackie Robinson's 42 that's been retired. So I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but they there is a push t- to retire number 21. Interesting, yeah, because yeah. it's... Uh... You know, not American, so that would, you know, Jackie obviously was. Yeah, yeah. And you would think that would be, they, they could mm-hmm. go that route. Well, if I, they're, both, they're both great human beings. Oh, yeah. I met, I met both of them. Oh, I've you heard, got to meet Jackie one, Robinson? Well, that's, oh, yeah, real, that's yeah. really cool. And, yeah. and it's, I, I still kick myself when I think about those days. Yeah. All the people I met way back in the day. Mm-hmm. If I'd have gotten an autograph for sure. each of them. That. I'd be a multi-millionaire today. Absolutely. I think Jackie Robinson's widow is still alive. I think I saw yes, her. Until she th- is. That's amazing. Yes, she is. And she looks wonderful. Yeah. And I think Roberto's wife is is still alive as well. Is too, isn't she? Yes. Yeah. yeah Crazy. Makes, I think you're right. Yes. What a shame. If, if Roberto would have survived, he'd be around with us today. And he, it's just, it's a sad, sad situation. But, um, the last question I have for you is your son, Connor. He followed your footsteps. He played ball at Notre Dame as an offensive lineman. But I must tell you, when I saw him and read about him, your kid has size. He's a big kid. I know you mentioned he had some issues with concussions, but did he ever consider going pro? Yeah, he couldn't. I mean, he, there's no doubt in my mind that he could have played in the, in the pros. I mean, he was 6'5", uh, 3'10". Jeez. And very, very, as a guard. And he was very fast, and he was very strong, great feet. I mean, he could, you know, no one ever got by him in pass protection. And uh, but he had so, too many concussions, in mm-hmm. Notre Dame. and so he couldn't play his fifth year. And so he stayed on the, you know, they let him go. To get, he got his one year MBA. Good for him. And now he works works on Wall, Wall Street as a investment banker. So outstanding. He's down, he's down to uh, he's six five two thirty now. Yeah. Wow. He's lost 80, 80 pounds from his playing days, Man. which is which is perfect because the last thing you need is all that. He used to have to eat six thousand calories a day. My goodness! To ma- maintain his weight. Wow! That's... And now he just get back to like twenty five hundred, and it just you know the weight just falls off you. Wow! Did you ever play football with him in the backyard? No. <laughs> Yeah. There wasn't, wasn't much you could do, but he was, we, you know, I coached him in football, I coached him in baseball, sure. coached him in basketball, you know. <laughs> he was a good athlete. He did everything very well. And a great, you know, he, can, he was a great golf swing. He doesn't play enough, but he can knock the heck out of the ball. Yeah, I'm sure, being that big. Um, so, for our listeners, Terry Henry, you have your own podcast. It's called Hanratty's Huddle. I want you to tell our audience about that podcast and how can they listen to it or where can they find it. It's, uh, it's something that I've thought about doing for the last couple of years, and, and I never knew the, the, the technical part of how, how to do it. I found a couple of guys in uh, Connecticut here, and we got together, and we just recorded our, my third show this afternoon, so it's, it's going to be on Handwriting, Handwriting's Huddle. And the best place to go right now is to Spotify, and, and you go on there, and you get a uh, podcast, and you just type in Handwriting's Huddle, and it, and it pops right up. Yeah, but it is plural, hand ratties, huddle. So uh, it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we, we talk about a lot of Steelers stuff. We talk a lot of Notre Dame stuff. We, today we talked about, you know, Michigan and Jim Harp, Harbaugh, the problem they're having up there. And, uh, you know, the, the NIL and the, all that good stuff that's going on. The, the new things that are happening in uh, college football. So it's fun. It's, it's getting, uh, it's a little rough to start out, but it's getting a lot better. So, uh I think we should be cranking away pretty good here. So it's a lot of fun, though. I enjoy it. Perfect. Because one of the things I've learned about podcasting is don't worry about who's listening right off the bat. Just have fun with it. Um, and, you know, and it, it will grow as time goes on. Um, so I'm sure yours will do well. And my podcast is always advertised uh, – uh, to- sports from a different angle with a Pittsburgh twist. So I know I have Pittsburgh fans out there, and hopefully they will tune in and, and listen to your podcast. Uh, and as I always do, Terry, I give my my guests the opportunity to leave the show with any parting words. So fire away with whatever you got. I just uh, enjoy sports. I mean, there's been a lot of negativity out there in the sports world, but you know, go to a game, cheer on your team, and. Now, don't worry about fighting with the other guy. I'm, there's too much too much uh, violence going on off the field in, in sports. 
Absolutely. I concur with that completely. I mean, it's the dumbest thing ever when these fans start fighting each other. And if you go to YouTube and you and Google that stuff, I mean, I've seen it with all the teams and people are just ridiculous and drinking too much and they start arguing about their teams and they end up throwing punches at each other. And it's a game and everybody's in it for the same thing. You want to see your team win, but you know, violence has nothing to do with it and it should not be part of it. So I no, and you see and you see so much in the parking lots and stuff like that. I know a lot of this happened in California in the parking lots and you know between the San Francisco 49er Giants and the and the, and the Dodgers and oh that one with know, the all, all, all yeah. the craziness. Yeah, it's, it's just not it's just not you know stop. Just watch the game. Enjoy enjoy the sports. It's a wonderful thing. Exactly. Well, this concludes another episode of Total Sports Recall. I would like to thank Terry Hanratty for taking the time to join the show. It's been an honor and a pleasure having a collegiate champion and a Super Bowl winner on the show. I will have another podcast this weekend as I will be talking about the 1974 Pittsburgh Steelers draft, which Terry remembers well. You can reach me with any comments or suggestions at my email, totalsportsrecall at gmail.com, or reaching out to me on Twitter using my handle, at tsrharv 59 Additionally, check out my YouTube channel, Total Sports Recall, and visit my website at totalsportsrecall.com. For Terry Hanratty, this is Harv Aronson wishing everyone a great weekend ahead. The contents of this podcast does not represent the opinions of others and is solely the opinions of Harv Aronson based on his experience, knowledge, and research. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Hello, football friends. This is Darren Hayes of the Pigskin Dispatch Podcast, and I'd like to invite you to the portal of positive football history, Pigskin Dispatch and pigskindispatch.com. We talk about everything that centers around the game of American football, expert discussions, the origins of the games, the great players, teams, and coaches, and more, and some great guests and insights from experts. We have new episodes three to four times a week, and you can find us on sportshistorynetwork.com, pigskindispatch.com, or your favorite podcast provider. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.